think, he answered, that we shall not be crushed. We have no more suffocation to fear. During the night the temperature of the water rose to one degree below zero. The injections could not carry it to a higher point. But, as the congelation of the sea water produces at least two degrees, I was at least reassured against the dangers of solidification. The next day, March 27, six yards of ice had been cleared, 12 feet only, remaining to be cleared away. There was yet 48 hours work. The air could not be renewed in the interior of the Nautilus. And this day would make it worse. An intolerable weight oppressed me. Towards three o'clock in the evening this feeling rose to a violent degree. Yawns dislocated my jaws. My lungs panted as they inhaled this burning fluid, which became rarefied more and more. A moral torpor took hold of me. I was powerless, almost unconscious. My brave concile though exhibiting the same symptoms and suffering in the same manner, never left me. He took my hand and encouraged me, and I heard him murmur, Oh, if I could only not breathe, so as to leave more air for my master. Tears came into my eyes on hearing him speak thus. If our situation to all was intolerable in the interior, with what haste and gladness would we put on our Cork jackets to work in our turn. Pickaxes sounded on the frozen ice beds. Our arms ached, the skin was torn off our hands. But what were these fatigues, what? Did the wounds matter? Vital air came to the lungs. We breathed. We breathed. All this time no one prolonged his voluntary task beyond the prescribed time. His task accomplished each one handed in turn to his panting companions the apparatus that supplied him with life. Captain Nemo set the example, and submitted first to this severe discipline. When the time came, he gave up his apparatus to another and returned to the vitiated air on board, calm, unflinching, unmurmuring. On that day the ordinary work was accomplished with unusual vigor. Only two Yards remained to be raised from the surface. Two yards only separated us from the open sea. But the reservoirs were nearly emptied of air. The little that remained ought to be kept for the workers, not a particle for the Nautilus. When I went back on board, I was half suffocated. What a night. I know not how to describe it. The next day my breathing was oppressed. Dizziness accompanied the pain in my head and made me like a drunken man. My companions showed the same symptoms. Some of the crew had rattling in the throat. On that day, the sixth of our imprisonment, Captain Nemo, finding the pickaxes, worked too slowly, resolved to crush the ice bed that still separated us from the liquid sheet. This man's coolness and energy never forsook him. He subdued his physical pains by moral force. By his orders the vessel was lightened, that is to say, raised from the ice bed. By a change of specific gravity. When it floated they towed it so as to bring it above the immense trench made on the level of the water line. Then, filling his reservoirs of water, he descended and shut himself up in the hole. Just then all the crew came on board, and the double door of communication was shut. The Nautilus then rested on the bed of ice, which was not one yard thick, and which the sounding leads had perforated in a thousand places. The taps of the reservoirs were then opened, and a hundred cubic yards of water was let in, increasing the weight of the Nautilus to 1,800 tons. We waited. We listened for getting our sufferings in hope. Our safety depended on this. Last chance. Notwithstanding the buzzing in my head, I soon heard the humming. Sound under the hull of the Nautilus. The ice cracked with a singular noise, like tearing paper, and the Nautilus sank. 
we are off, murmured Consile in my ear. I could not answer him. I seized his hand, and pressed it convulsively. All at once, carried away by its frightful overcharge, the Nautilus sank like a bullet under the waters, that is to say, it fell as if it was in a vacuum. Then, all the electric force was put on the pumps, that soon began to let the water out of the reservoirs. After some minutes, our fall was stopped. Soon, too, the manometer indicated an ascending movement. The screw, going at full speed, made the iron hull tremble to its very bolts and drew us towards the north. But if this floating under the iceberg is to last another day before we reach the open. See, I shall be dead first. Half stretched upon a divan in the library, I was suffocating. My face was purple, my lips blue, my faculties suspended. I neither saw nor heard. All notion of time had gone from my mind. My muscles could not contract. I do not. Know how many hours passed thus, but I was conscious of the agony that was coming over me. I felt as if I was going to die. Suddenly I came to some breaths of air penetrated my lungs. Had we risen to the surface of the waves? Were we free of the iceberg? No. Ned and Consile, my two brave friends, were sacrificing themselves to save me. Some particles of air still remained at the bottom of one apparatus. Instead of using it, they had kept it for me, and while they were being suffocated, they gave me life, drop by drop. I wanted to push back the thing, they held my hands, and for some moments I breathed freely. I looked at the clock, it was eleven in the morning. It ought to be the 28th of March. The Nautilus went at a frightful pace, 40 miles an hour. It literally tore through the water. Where was Captain Nemo? Had he succumbed? Were his companions dead with him? At the moment the manometer indicated that we were not more than 20 feet from the surface. A mere plate of ice separated us from the atmosphere. Could we not break it? Perhaps. In any case the Nautilus was going to attempt it. I felt that it was in an oblique position, lowering the stern, and raising the bows. The introduction of water had been the means of disturbing its equilibrium. Then, impelled by its powerful screw, it attacked the ice field from beneath like a formidable battering ram. It broke it by backing and then rushing forward against the field, which gradually gave way, and at last, dashing suddenly against it, shot forwards on the ice field, that crushed beneath its weight. The panel was opened one might say torn off and the pure air came in in abundance to all parts of the Nautilus. Chapter 17 From Cape Horn to the Amazon How I got onto the platform I have no idea, perhaps the Canadian had carried me there. But I breathed, I inhaled the vivifying sea air. My two companions were getting drunk with the fresh particles. The other unhappy men had been so long without food, that they could not with impunity indulge in the simplest elements that were given them. We, on the contrary, had no end to restrain ourselves we could draw this air freely into our lungs, and it was the breeze. The breeze alone, that filled us with this keen enjoyment. Ah, said Consile, how delightful this oxygen is. Master need not fear to breathe it. There is enough for everybody. Ned Land did not speak, but he opened his jaws wide enough to frighten a shark. Our strength soon returned, and, when I looked round me, I saw we were alone on the platform. The foreign seamen in the Nautilus were contented with the air that circulated in the interior, none of them had come to drink in the open air. 
The first words I spoke were words of gratitude and thankfulness to my two companions. Ned and Consile had prolonged my life during the last hours of this long agony. All my gratitude could not repay such devotion. My friends, said I, we are bound one to the other forever, and I am under infinite obligations to you. Which I shall take advantage of, exclaimed the Canadian. What do you mean? said Consile. I mean that I shall take you with me when I leave this infernal Nautilus. Well, said Consile, after all this, are we going right? Yes, I replied, for we are going the way of the sun, and here the sun is in the north. No doubt, said Ned Land, but it remains to be seen whether he will bring the ship into the Pacific or the Atlantic Ocean, that is, into frequented or deserted seas. I could not answer that question, and I feared that Captain Nemo would rather take us to the vast ocean that touches the coasts of Asia and America at the same time. He would thus complete the tour round the submarine world, and return to those waters in which the Nautilus could sail freely. We ought, before long, to settle this important point. The Nautilus went at a rapid pace. The polar circle was soon passed, and the course shaped for Cape Horn. We were off the American point, March 31st, at 7 o'clock in the evening. Then all our past sufferings were forgotten. The remembrance of that imprisonment in the ice was effaced from our minds. We only thought of the future. Captain Nemo did not appear again either in the drawing room or on the platform. The point shown each day on the planisphere, and, marked by the lieutenant, showed me the exact direction of the Nautilus. Now, on that evening, it was evident, to my great satisfaction, that we were going back to the north by the Atlantic. The next day, April 1st, when the Nautilus Ascended to the surface some minutes before noon, we sighted land to the west. It was Tierra del Fuego, which the first navigators named thus from seeing the quantity of smoke that rose from the natives' huts. The coast seemed low to me. But in the distance rose high mountains. I even thought I had a glimpse of Mount Sarmiento, that rises 2,070 yards above the level of the sea, with a very pointed summit, which, according as it is misty or clear, is a sign of fine ore, of wet weather. At this moment the peak was clearly defined against the sky. The Nautilus, diving again under the water, approached the coast, which was only some few miles off. From the glass windows in the drawing room, I saw long seaweeds and gigantic fusi and varec, of which the open polar sea contain so many specimens, with their sharp polished filaments, they measured about 300 yards in length real cables, thicker than one's thumb, and, having great tenacity, they are often used as ropes for vessels. Another weed known as velp, with leaves four feet long, buried in the coral concretions, hung at the bottom. It served as nest and food for myriads of crustacea and mollusks, crabs, and cuttlefish. Their seals and otters had splendid repasts, eating the flesh of fish with sea vegetables, according to the English fashion. Over this fertile and luxuriant ground the Nautilus passed with great rapidity. Towards evening it approached the Falkland group, the rough summits of which I recognized the following day. The depth of the sea was moderate. On the shores, our nets brought in beautiful specimens of seaweed, and particularly a certain fucus, the roots of which were filled with the best mussels in the world. Geese and ducks fell by dozens on the platform, and soon took their places in the pantry on board. When the last heights of the Falklands had disappeared from the horizon, the Nautilus sank to between 20 and 25 yards, and followed the American coast. Captain Nemo did not show himself. 
until the 3rd of April we did not quit the shores of Patagonia, sometimes under the ocean, sometimes at the surface. The Nautilus passed beyond the large estuary formed by the Uruguay. Its direction was northwards, and followed the long windings of the coast of South America. We had then made 1,600 miles since our embarkation in the seas of Japan. About 11 o'clock in the morning the Tropic of Capricorn was crossed on the 37th meridian, and we passed Cape Frio standing out to sea. Captain Nemo, to Ned Land's great displeasure, did not like the neighborhood of the inhabited coasts of Brazil, for we went at a giddy speed. Not a fish, not a bird of the swiftest kind could follow us, and the natural curiosities of these seas escaped all observation. This speed was kept up for several days, and in the evening of the 9th of April, we sighted the most westerly point of South America that forms Cape San Roque. But then the Nautilus swerved again, and sought the lowest depth of a submarine valley which is between this Cape and Sierra Leone on the African coast. This valley bifurcates to the parallel of the Antilles, and terminates at the mouth by the enormous depression of 9,000 yards. In this place, the geological basin of the ocean forms, as far as the Lesser Antilles, a cliff to three and a half miles perpendicular in height, and, at the parallel of the Cape Verde Islands, an other wall not less considerable, that encloses thus all the sunk continent of the Atlantic. The bottom of this immense valley is dotted with some mountains, that give to these submarine places a picturesque aspect. I speak, moreover, from the manuscript charts that were in the library of the Nautilus charts evidently due to Captain Nemo's hand, and made after his personal observations. For two days the desert and deep waters were visited by means of the inclined plains. The Nautilus was furnished with long diagonal broadsides which carried it to all elevations. But on the 11th of April it rose suddenly, and land appeared at the mouth of the Amazon River, a vast estuary, the embouchure of which is so considerable that it freshens the sea water for the distance of several leagues. The equator was crossed. Twenty miles to the west were the Guyanas, a French territory, on which we could have found an easy refuge, but a stiff breeze was blowing, and the furious waves would not have allowed a single boat to face them. Ned Land understood that, no doubt, for he spoke not a word about it. For my part, I made no allusion to his schemes of flight, for I would not urge him to make an attempt that must inevitably fail. I made the time pass pleasantly by interesting studies. During the days of April 11th and 12th, the Nautilus did not leave the surface of the sea, and the net brought in a marvelous haul of zoophytes, fish, and reptiles. Some zoophytes had been fished. Up by the chain of the nets, they were for the most part beautiful. Fictolins, belonging to the Actinidion family, and among other species the Fictalis protexta, peculiar to that part of the ocean, with a little cylindrical trunk, ornamented with vertical lines, speckled with red dots, crowning a marvelous blossoming of tentacles. As to the mollusks, they consisted of some I had already observed turritellas, olive porphyrus, with regular lines intercrossed, with red spots standing out plainly against the flesh, a pterosaurus, like petrified scorpions, translucid hyales, argonauts, cuttlefish, excellent eating, and certain species of calmars that naturalists of antiquity have classed amongst the flying fish, and that serve principally for bait for cod fishing. I had now an opportunity of studying several species of fish on these shores. Amongst the cartilaginous ones, Petromazons pricot, a sort of eel, 15 inches long, with a greenish head, violet fins, gray-blue back, brown belly, 
silvered and sewn with bright spots, the pupil of the eye. Encircled with gold a curious animal, that the current of the Amazon had drawn. To the sea, for they inhabit fresh waters tuberculated streaks, with pointed snouts, and a long loose tail, armed with a long jagged sting, little sharks, a yard long, grey and whitish skin, and several rows of teeth, bent back, that are generally known by the name of pantoufles, vespertilios, a kind of red isosceles triangle, half a yard long, to which pectorals are attached by fleshy prolongations that make them look like bats, but that their horny appendage situated near the nostrils, has given them the name of sea unicorns, lastly. Some species of Balistae, the Curasavian, whose spots were of a brilliant gold color, and the Capriscus of clear violet, and with varying shades like a pigeon's throat. I end here this catalogue, which is somewhat dry perhaps, but very exact, with a series of bony fish that I observed in passing belonging to the Apteronotes, and whose snout is white as snow, the body of a beautiful black, marked with a very long loose fleshy strip, Odontognathes, armed with spikes, sardines nine inches long, glittering with a bright silver light, a species of mackerel, provided with two anal fins, centronotes of a blackish tint, that are fished. For with torches, long fish, two yards in length, with fat flesh, white and firm, which, when they are fresh, taste like eel, and when dry, like smoked. Salmon, la brise, half red, covered with scales only at the bottom of the dorsal. And anal fins, chrysoptera, on which gold and silver blend their brightness. With that of the ruby and topaz, golden tailed spears, the flesh of which is extremely delicate, and whose phosphorescent properties betray them in the midst of the waters, orange colored spears with long tongues, magers, with gold caudal fins, dark thorn tails, anableps of Suriname, etc. Notwithstanding this, etc., I must not omit to mention fish that can sile. Will long remember, and with good reason. One of our nets had hauled up a sort of very flat ray fish, which, with the tail cut off, formed a perfect disc, and weighed twenty ounces. It was white underneath, red above, with large round spots of dark blue encircled with black, very glossy skin, terminating in a bilobed fin. Laid out on the platform, it struggled, tried to turn itself by convulsive movements, and made so many efforts, that one last turn had nearly sent it into the sea. But Consile, not wishing to let the fish go, rushed to it, and, before I could prevent him, had seized it with both hands. In a moment, he was overthrown, his legs in the air, and half his body paralyzed, crying, Oh, master, master, help me. It was the first time the poor boy had spoken to me so familiarly. The Canadian. And I took him up, and rubbed his contracted arms till he became sensible. The. Unfortunate Consile had attacked a cramp fish of the most dangerous kind, the. Cumana. This odd animal, in a medium conductor like water, strikes fish at. Several yards distance, so great is the power of its electric organ, the two principal surfaces of which do not measure less than 27 square feet. The next day, April 12, the Nautilus approached the Dutch coast, near the mouth of the Moroni. There several groups of sea cows herded together, they were manatees, that, like the Dugong and the Stel Lyra, belong to the Skenian order. These beautiful animals, peaceable and inoffensive, from 18 to 21 feet in length, weigh at least 1600 weight. I told Ned. Land and Consile that provident nature had assigned an important role to these. Mammalia. Indeed, they, like the seals, are designed to graze on the submarine. Prairies, 
and thus destroy the accumulation of weed that obstructs the tropical rivers. And do you know, I added, what has been the result since men have almost entirely annihilated this useful race? That the putrefied weeds have poisoned the air, and the poisoned air causes the yellow fever, that desolates these beautiful countries. Enormous vegetations are multiplied under the torrid seas. And the evil is irresistibly developed from the mouth of the Rio de la Plata to Florida. If we are to believe Tausnell, this plague is nothing to what it would be if the seas were cleaned of whales and seals. Then, infested with pulps, medusae, and cuttlefish, they would become immense centers of infection, since their waves would not possess these vast stomachs that God had charged to infest the surface of the seas. Chapter 18 The Pulps For several days the Nautilus kept off from the American coast. Evidently it did not wish to risk the tides of the Gulf of Mexico or of the Sea of the Antilles. April 16, we sighted Martinique and Guadeloupe from a distance of about 30 miles. I saw their tall peaks for an instant. The Canadian, who counted on carrying out his projects in the Gulf, by either landing or hailing one of the numerous boats that coast from one island to another, was quite disheartened. Flight would have been quite practicable, if Ned Land had been able to take possession of the boat without the captain's knowledge. But in the open sea it could not be thought of. The Canadian Concile, and I had a long conversation on this subject. For six months we had been prisoners on board the Nautilus. We had traveled 17,000 leagues. And, as Ned Land said, there was no reason why it should come to an end. We could hope nothing from the captain of the Nautilus, but only from ourselves. Besides, for some time past he had become graver, more retired, less sociable. He seemed to shun me. I met him rarely. Formerly he was pleased to explain the submarine marvels to me, now he left me to my studies, and came no more to the saloon. What change had come over him? For what cause? For my part. I did not wish to bury with me my curious and novel studies. I had now the power to write the true book of the sea, and this book, sooner or later, I wished to see daylight. The land nearest us was the archipelago of the Bahamas. There rose high submarine cliffs covered with large weeds. It was about eleven o'clock when Ned Land drew my attention to a formidable pricking, like the sting of an ant, which was produced by means of large seaweeds. Well, I said, these are proper caverns for pulps, and I should not be astonished to see some of these monsters. What? said Concile, cuttlefish, real cuttlefish of the cephalopod class. No, I said, pulps of huge dimensions. I will never believe that such animals exist, said Ned. Well, said Concile, with the most serious air in the world, I remember. Perfectly to have seen a large vessel drawn under the waves by an octopus's arm. You saw that, said the Canadian. Yes. Ned. With your own eyes. With my own eyes. Where, pray, might that be? At St. Malo, answered Concile. In the port, said Ned, ironically. No, in a church, replied Concile. In a church, cried the Canadian. Yes, friend Ned. In a picture representing the pulp in question. Good, said Ned Land bursting out laughing. He is quite right, I said. I have heard of this picture, but the subject represented is taken from a legend, and you know what to think of legends in the matter of natural history. Besides, when it is a question of monsters, the imagination is apt to run wild. Not only is it supposed that these pulps can draw down vessels, but a certain Olaz Magnus speaks of an octopus a mile long. 
that is more like an island than an animal. It is also said that the Bishop of Nidros was building an altar on an immense rock. Mass finished, the rock began to walk, and returned to the sea. The rock was a pulp. Another bishop, Pontopidan, speaks also of a pulp on which a regiment of cavalry could manoeuvre. Lastly, the ancient naturalists speak of monsters whose mouths were like gulfs, and which were too large to pass through the Straits of Gibraltar. But how much is true of these stories, ask Concile. Nothing, my friends, at least of that which passes the limit of truth to get to fable or legend. Nevertheless, there must be some ground for the imagination of the storytellers. One cannot deny that pulps and cuttlefish exist of a large species, inferior, however, to the cetaceans. Aristotle has stated the dimensions of a cuttlefish as five cubits, or nine feet two inches. R. Fishermen frequently see some that are more than four feet long. Some skeletons of pulps are preserved in the museums of Trieste and Montpellier, that measure two yards in length. Besides, according to the calculations of some naturalists, one of these animals only six feet long would have tentacles. Twenty-seven feet long. That would suffice to make a formidable monster. Do they fish for them in these days? asked Ned. If they do not fish for them, sailors see them at least. One of my friends, Captain Paul Boss of Haver, has often affirmed that he met one of these monsters of colossal dimensions in the Indian seas. But the most astonishing fact, and which does not permit of the denial of the existence of these gigantic animals, happened some years ago, in 1861. What is the fact? asked Ned Land. This is it. In 1861, to the northeast of Tenerife, very nearly in the same latitude we are in now, the crew of the dispatch boat Elector perceived a monstrous cuttlefish swimming in the waters. Captain Bigger went near to the animal, and attacked it with harpoon and guns, without much success, for balls. And harpoons glided over the soft flesh. After several fruitless attempts the crew tried to pass a slip knot round the body of the mollusk. The noose slipped as far as the tail fins and there stopped. They tried then to haul it on board. But its weight was so considerable that the tightness of the cord separated the tail from the body, and, deprived of this ornament, he disappeared under the water. Indeed, is that a fact? An indisputable fact, my good Ned. They proposed to name this pulp buggers. Cuttlefish. What length was it? asked the Canadian. Did it not measure about six yards? said Concile, who, posted at the window, was examining again the irregular windings of the cliff. Precisely, I replied. Its head, rejoined Concile, was it not crowned with eight tentacles, that beat the water like a nest of serpents. Precisely. Had not its eyes, placed at the back of its head, considerable development. Yes, concile. And was not its mouth like a parrot's beak. Exactly, concile. Very well, no offense to master, he replied, quietly, if this is not. Bigger's cuttlefish, it is, at least, one of its brothers. I looked at Concile. Ned Land hurried to the window. What a horrible beast, he cried. I looked in my turn, and could not repress a gesture of disgust. Before my eyes. Was a horrible monster worthy to figure in the legends of the marvelous. It. Was an immense cuttlefish, being eight yards long. It swam crossways in the. Direction of the Nautilus with great speed, watching us with its. Enormous staring green eyes. Its eight arms, or rather feet, fixed to its head. That have given the name of cephalopod to these animals, were twice as long as. Its body, and were twisted like the fury's hair. One could see the 250 air. 
holes on the inner side of the tentacles. The monster's mouth, a horned beak. Like a parrot's, opened and shut vertically. Its tongue, a horned substance. Furnished with several rows of pointed teeth, came out quivering from this. Veritable pair of shears. What a freak of nature, a bird's beak on a mollusk. Its spindle-like body formed a fleshy mass that might weigh 4,000 to 5,000 pounds, the varying color changing with great rapidity, according to the irritation of the animal, passed successively from livid gray to reddish brown. What irritated this mollusk? No doubt the presence of the nautilus, more formidable than itself, and on which its suckers or its jaws had no hold. Yet, what monsters these pulps are? What vitality the creator has given them? What vigor in their movements? And they possess three hearts. Chance had brought us in presence of this cuttlefish, and I did not wish to lose the opportunity of carefully studying this specimen of cephalopods. I overcame the horror that inspired me, and, taking a pencil, began to draw it. Perhaps this is the same which the elector saw, said Consile. No, replied the Canadian, for this is whole, and the other had lost its tail. That is no reason, I replied. The arms and tails of these animals are reformed by renewal, and in seven years the tail of Bugger's cuttlefish has no doubt had time to grow. By this time other pulps appeared at the port light. I counted seven. They formed a procession after the Nautilus, and I heard their beaks gnashing against the iron hull. I continued my work. These monsters kept in the water with such precision that they seemed immovable. Suddenly the Nautilus stopped. A shock made it tremble in every plate. Have we struck anything? I asked. In any case, replied the Canadian, we shall be free for we are floating. The Nautilus was floating, no doubt, but it did not move. A minute. Passed. Captain Nemo, followed by his lieutenant, entered the drawing room. I. Had not seen him for some time. He seemed dull. Without noticing or speaking to. Us, he went to the panel, looked at the pulps, and said something to his. Lieutenant. The ladder went out. Soon the panels were shut. The ceiling was lighted. I went towards the captain. A curious collection of pulps. I said. Yes, indeed, Mr. Naturalist, he replied, and we are going to fight them, man. To beast. I looked at him. I thought I had not heard aright. Man to beast. I repeated. Yes. Sir. The screw is stopped. I think that the horny jaws of one of the cuttlefish is entangled in the blades. That is what prevents our moving. What are you going to do? Rise to the surface, and slaughter this vermin. A difficult enterprise. Yes, indeed. The electric bullets are powerless against the soft flesh, where they do not find resistance enough to go off but we shall attack them with the hatchet. And the harpoon, sir, said the Canadian, if you do not refuse my help, I will accept it, Master Land. We will follow you, I said, and, following Captain Nemo, we went towards the central staircase. There, about ten men with boarding hatchets were ready for the attack. Concile. And I took two hatchets, Ned Land seized a harpoon. The Nautilus had then risen to the surface. One of the sailors, posted on the top ladder step, unscrewed the bolts of the panels. But hardly were the screws loosed, when the panel rose with great violence, evidently drawn by the suckers of a pulp's arm. Immediately one of these arms slid like a serpent down the opening and twenty others were above. With one blow of the axe, Captain Nemo cut this formidable tentacle, that slid wriggling down the ladder. 
just as we were. Pressing one on the other to reach the platform, two other arms, lashing the air, came down on the seaman placed before Captain Nemo, and lifted him up with irresistible power. Captain Nemo uttered a cry, and rushed out. We hurried. After him. One of these long arms glided through the opening. What a scene. The unhappy man, seized by the tentacle and fixed to the suckers, was balanced in the air at the caprice of this enormous trunk. He rattled in his throat, he was stifled, he cried, help, help. These words, spoken in French, startled me. I had a fellow countryman on board, perhaps several. That heart-rending cry. I shall hear it all my life. The unfortunate man was lost. Who could rescue him from that powerful pressure? However, Captain Nemo had rushed to the pulp, and with one blow of the axe had cut through one arm. His lieutenant struggled furiously against other monsters that crept on the flanks of the Nautilus. The crew fought with their axes. The Canadian, Concile. And I buried our weapons in the fleshy masses, a strong smell of musk. Penetrated the atmosphere. It was horrible. For one instant, I thought the unhappy man, entangled with the pulp, would be torn from its powerful suction. Seven of the eight arms had been cut off. One only wriggled in the air, brandishing the victim like a feather. But just as Captain Nemo and his lieutenant threw themselves on it, the animal ejected a stream of black liquid. We were blinded with it. When the cloud dispersed, the Cuttlefish had disappeared, and my unfortunate countrymen with it. Ten or twelve pulps now invaded the platform and sides of the Nautilus. We rolled pell-mell into the midst of this nest of serpents, that wriggled on the platform in the waves of blood and ink. It seemed as though these slimy tentacles sprang up like the hydra's heads. Ned Land's harpoon, at each stroke was plunged into the staring eyes of the cuttlefish. But my bold companion was suddenly overturned by the tentacles of a monster he had not been able to avoid. Ah! How my heart beat with emotion and horror! The formidable beak of a cuttlefish was open over Ned Land. The unhappy man would be cut in two. I rushed to his succour. But Captain Nemo was before me, his axe disappeared between the two enormous jaws, and, miraculously saved, the Canadian, rising, plunged his harpoon deep into the triple heart of the pulp. I owed myself this revenge, said the captain to the Canadian. Ned bowed without replying. The combat had lasted a quarter of an hour. The monsters, vanquished and mutilated, left us at last, and disappeared under the waves. Captain Nemo, covered with blood, nearly exhausted, gazed upon the sea that had swallowed up one of his companions, and great tears gathered in his eyes. Chapter 19 The Gulf Stream This terrible scene of the 20th of April none of us can ever forget. I have written it under the influence of violent emotion. Since then I have revised the recital, I have read it to Consile and to the Canadian. They found it exact. As to facts, but insufficient as to effect. To paint such pictures, one must have the pen of the most illustrious of our poets, the author of the Toilers of the Deep. I have said that Captain Nemo wept while watching the waves, his grief was great. It was the second companion he had lost since our arrival on board, and what a death. That friend, crushed, stifled, bruised by the dreadful arms of a pulp, pounded by his iron jaws, would not rest with his comrades in the peaceful coral cemetery. In the midst of the struggle, it was the despairing cry uttered by the unfortunate man that had torn my heart. The poor Frenchman. 
forgetting his conventional language, had taken to his own mother tongue, to utter a last appeal. Amongst the crew of the Nautilus, associated with the body and soul of the captain, recoiling like him from all contact with men. I had a fellow countryman. Did he alone represent France in this mysterious association, evidently composed of individuals of diverse nationalities? It was one of these insoluble problems that rose up unceasingly before my mind. Captain Nemo entered his room, and I saw him no more for some time. But that he was sad and irresolute I could see by the vessel, of which he was the soul, and which received all his impressions. The Nautilus did not keep on in its settled course, it floated about like a corpse at the will of the waves. It went at random. He could not tear himself away from the scene of the last struggle, from this sea that had devoured one of his men. Ten days passed thus. It was not till the first of May that the Nautilus resumed its northerly course, after having sighted the Bahamas at the mouth of the Bahama Canal. We were then following the current from the largest river to the sea, that has its banks, its fish, and its proper temperatures. I mean the Gulf Stream. It is really a river, that flows freely to the middle of the Atlantic, and whose waters do not mix with the ocean waters. It is a salt river, salter than the surrounding sea. Its mean depth is 1,500 fathoms, its mean breadth 10 miles. In certain places the current flows with the speed of 2 miles and a half an hour. The body of its waters is more considerable than that of all the rivers in the globe. It was on this ocean river that the Nautilus then sailed. I must add that, during the night, the phosphorescent waters of the Gulf Stream rivaled the electric power of our watchlight, especially in the stormy weather that threatened us so frequently. May 8, we were still crossing Cape Hatteras, at the height of the North Caroline. The width of the Gulf Stream. There is 75 miles, and its depth 210 yards. The Nautilus still went at random, all supervision seemed abandoned. I thought that, under these circumstances, escape would be possible. Indeed, the inhabited shores offered anywhere an easy refuge. The sea was incessantly plowed by the steamers that ply between New York or Boston and the Gulf of Mexico, and overrun day and night by the little schooners coasting about the several parts of the American coast. We could hope to be picked up. It was a favorable opportunity. Notwithstanding the thirty miles that separated the Nautilus from the coasts of the Union, one unfortunate circumstance thwarted the Canadians' plans. The weather was very bad. We were nearing those shores where tempests are so frequent, that country of water spouts and cyclones actually engendered by the current of the Gulf Stream. To tempt the sea in a frail boat was certain destruction. Ned Land owned this himself. He fretted, seized with nostalgia. That flight only could cure. Master, he said that day to me, this must come to an end. I must make a clean breast of it. This Nemo is leaving land and going up to the north. But I declare to you that I have had enough of the South Pole, and I will not follow him to the north. What is to be done, Ned, since flight is impracticable just now? We must speak to the captain, said he, you said nothing when we were in your native seas. I will speak, now we are in mine. When I think that before long, the Nautilus will be by Nova Scotia, and that there near Newfoundland is a large bay, and into that bay the St. Lawrence empties itself, and that the St. Lawrence is my river, the river by Quebec, my native town when I think of this, I feel furious, it makes my hair stand on end. Sir, I would rather throw myself into the sea. I will not stay here. I am stifled. 
the Canadian was evidently losing all patience. His vigorous nature could not stand this prolonged imprisonment. His face altered daily, his temper became more surly. I knew what he must suffer, for I was seized with homesickness. Myself. Nearly seven months had passed without our having had any news from land, Captain Nemo's isolation, his altered spirits, especially since the fight. With the pulps, his taciturnity, all made me view things in a different light. Well, sir, said Ned, seeing I did not reply. Well, Ned, do you wish me to ask Captain Nemo his intentions concerning us? Yes, sir. Although he has already made them known. Yes, I wish it settled finally. Speak for me, in my name only, if you like. But I so seldom meet him. He avoids me. That is all the more reason for you to go to see him. I went to my room. From thence I meant to go to Captain Nemo's. It would not do. To let this opportunity of meeting him slip. I knocked at the door. No answer. I knocked again, then turned the handle. The door opened, I went in. The captain was there. Bending over his work table, he had not heard me. Resolved. Not to go without having spoken, I approached him. He raised his head quickly. Frowned, and said roughly, You hear. What do you want? To speak to you, Captain. But I am busy, sir, I am working. I leave you at liberty to shut yourself up. Cannot I be allowed the same? This reception was not encouraging, but I was determined to hear an answer. Everything. Sir, I said coldly, I have to speak to you on a matter that admits of no delay. What is that, sir, he replied, ironically. Have you discovered something that has escaped me, or has the sea delivered up any new secrets? We were at cross purposes. But, before I could reply, he showed me an open manuscript on his table, and said, in a more serious tone, here, Emeronax, is a manuscript written in several languages. It contains the sum of my studies of the sea, and, if it please God, it shall not perish with me. This manuscript, signed with my name, complete with the history of my life, will be shut up in a little floating case. The last survivor of all of us on board the Nautilus will throw this case into the sea, and it will go whither it is. Born by the waves. This man's name. His history written by himself. His mystery would then be revealed some day. Captain, I said, I can but approve of the idea that makes you act thus. The result of your studies must not be lost. But the means you employ seem to me to be primitive. Who knows where the winds will carry this case, and in whose hands it will fall? Could you not use some other means? Could not you, or one of yours? Never, sir, he said, hastily interrupting me. But I and my companions are ready to keep this manuscript in store, and, if you will put us at liberty. At liberty, said the captain, rising. Yes, sir, that is the subject on which I wish to question you. For seven months we have been here on board, and I ask you today, in the name of my companions and in my own, if your intention is to keep us here always. Emeron acts, I will answer you today as I did seven months ago, whoever enters. The Nautilus, must never quit it. You impose actual slavery upon us. Give it what name you please. But everywhere the slave has the right to regain his liberty. Who denies you this right? Have I ever tried to chain you with an oath? He looked at me with his arms crossed. Sir, I said, to return a second time to this subject will be neither to your nor to my taste, but, as we have entered upon it, let us go through with it. I repeat, 
it is not only myself whom it concerns. Study is to me a relief, a diversion, a passion that could make me forget everything. Like you, I am willing to live obscure, in the frail hope of bequeathing one day, to future time, the result of my labors. But it is otherwise with Ned Land. Every man, worthy of the name, deserves some consideration. Have you thought that love of liberty, hatred of slavery, can give rise to schemes of revenge in a nature, like the Canadians, that he could think, attempt, and try? I was silenced, Captain Nemo rose. Whatever Ned Land thinks of, attempts, or tries, what does it matter to me? I did not seek him. It is not for my pleasure that I keep him on board. As for you, Emeronax, you are one of those who can understand everything, even silence. I have nothing more to say to you. Let this first time you have come to treat of this subject be the last, for a second time I will not listen to you. I retired. Our situation was critical. I related my conversation to my two companions. We know now, said Ned, that we can expect nothing from this man. The Nautilus is nearing Long Island. We will escape, whatever the weather may be. But the sky became more and more threatening. Symptoms of a hurricane became manifest. The atmosphere was becoming white and misty. On the horizon fine. Streaks of cirrus clouds were succeeded by masses of cumuli. Other low clouds passed swiftly by. The swollen sea rose in huge billows. The birds disappeared. With the exception of the petrels, those friends of the storm. The barometer fell sensibly, and indicated an extreme extension of the vapors. The mixture of the storm glass was decomposed under the influence of the electricity that pervaded the atmosphere. The tempest burst on the 18th of May, just as the Nautilus was floating off Long Island, some miles from the port of New York. I can describe the strife of the elements. For, instead of fleeing to the depths of the sea, Captain Nemo, by an unaccountable caprice, would brave it at the surface. The wind blew from the southwest at first. Captain Nemo, during the squalls, had taken his place on the platform. He had made himself fast, to prevent being washed overboard by the monstrous waves. I had hoisted myself up, and made myself fast also, dividing my admiration between the tempest and this extraordinary man who was coping with it. The raging sea was swept by huge cloud drifts, which were actually saturated with the waves. The Nautilus, sometimes lying on its side, sometimes standing up like a mast, rolled and pitched terribly. About five o'clock a torrent of rain fell. That lulled neither sea nor wind. The hurricane blew nearly forty leagues an hour. It is under these conditions that it overturns houses, breaks iron gates, displaces twenty-four pounders. However, the Nautilus, in the midst of the tempest, confirmed the words of a clever engineer, there is no well-constructed hull that cannot defy the sea. This was not a resisting rock. It was a steel spindle, obedient and movable, without rigging or masts, that braved its fury with impunity. However, I watched these raging waves attentively. They measured 15 feet in height, and 150 to 175 yards long. And their speed of propagation was 30 feet per second. Their bulk and power increased with the depth of the water. Such waves as these, at the Hebrides, have displaced a mass weighing 8,400 pounds. They are they which, in the tempest of December 23, 1864, after destroying the town of Yedo, in Japan, broke the same day on the shores of America. 
the intensity of the tempest increased with the night. The barometer, as in 1860 at reunion during a cyclone, fell seven tenths at the close of day. I saw a large vessel pass the horizon, struggling painfully. She was trying to lie to under half steam, to keep up above the waves. It was probably one of the steamers of the line from New York to Liverpool, or Haver. It soon disappeared in the gloom. At ten o'clock in the evening the sky was on fire. The atmosphere was streaked with vivid lightning. I could not bear the brightness of it, while the captain, looking at it, seemed to envy the spirit of the tempest. A terrible noise filled the air, a complex noise, made up of the howls of the crushed waves, the roaring of the wind, and the claps of thunder. The wind veered suddenly to all points of the horizon. And the cyclone, rising in the east, returned after passing by the north, west, and south, in the inverse course pursued by the circular storm of the southern hemisphere. Ah, that gulf stream. It deserves its name of the king of tempests. It is that which causes those formidable cyclones, by the difference of temperature between its air and its currents. A shower of fire had succeeded. The rain. The drops of water were changed to sharp spikes. One would have thought that Captain Nemo was courting a death worthy of himself, a death by lightning. As the Nautilus, pitching dreadfully, raised its steel spur. In the air, it seemed to act as a conductor, and I saw long sparks burst from it. Crushed and without strength I crawled to the panel, opened it, and descended to the saloon. The storm was then at its height. It was impossible to stand upright in the interior of the Nautilus. Captain Nemo came down. About twelve. I heard the reservoirs filling by degrees, and the Nautilus sank slowly beneath the waves. Through the open windows in the saloon I saw large fish terrified, passing like phantoms in the water. Some were struck before my eyes. The Nautilus was still descending. I thought that at about eight fathoms deep we should find a calm. But no. The upper beds were too violently agitated for that. We had to seek repose at more than 25 fathoms in the bowels of the deep. But there, what quiet, what silence, what peace. Who could have told that such a hurricane had been let loose on the surface of that ocean? Chapter XX From latitude 47 degrees 24 minutes to longitude 17 degrees 28 minutes. In consequence of the storm, we had been thrown eastward once more. All hope of escape on the shores of New York or St. Lawrence had faded away, and poor Ned, in despair, had isolated himself like Captain Nemo. Consile and I, however, never left each other. I said that the Nautilus had gone aside to the east. I should have said, to be more exact, the northeast. For some days, it wandered first on the surface, and then beneath it, amid those fogs so dreaded by sailors. What accidents are due to these thick fogs? What shocks upon these reefs when the wind drowns the breaking of the waves? What collisions between vessels, in spite of their warning lights, whistles, and alarm bells? And the bottoms of these seas look like a field of battle, where still lie all the conquered of the ocean, some old and already encrusted, others fresh and reflecting from their iron bands and copper plates the brilliancy of our lantern. On the 15th of May we were at the extreme south of the bank of Newfoundland. This bank consists of olivia, or large heaps of organic matter, brought either from the equator by the Gulf Stream, or from the North Pole by the countercurrent of cold water which skirts the American coast. There also are heaped up those erratic blocks which are carried along by the broken ice, and close by, a vast charnel house of mollusks, 
which perish here by millions. The depth of the sea is not great at Newfoundland not more than some hundreds of fathoms, but towards the south is a depression of 1,500 fathoms. There the gulf stream widens. It loses some of its speed and some of its temperature, but it becomes a sea. It was on the 17th of May, about 500 miles from heart's content, at a depth of more than 1,400 fathoms, that I saw the electric cable lying on the bottom. Consile, to whom I had not mentioned it, thought at first that it was a gigantic sea serpent. But I undeceived the worthy fellow, and by way of consolation related several particulars in the laying of this cable. The first one was late in the years 1857 and 1858, but, after transmitting about 400 telegrams, would not act any longer. In 1863 the engineers constructed another one, measuring 2,000 miles in length, and weighing 4,500 tons, which was embarked on the Great Eastern. This attempt also failed. On the 25th of May the Nautilus, being at a depth of more than 1,918 fathoms, was on the precise spot where the rupture occurred which ruined the enterprise. It was within 638 miles of the coast of Ireland, and at half past two in the afternoon they discovered that communication with Europe had ceased. The electricians on board resolved to cut the cable before fishing it up, and at 11 o'clock at night they had recovered the damaged part. They made another point and spliced it, and it was once more submerged. But some days after it broke again, and in the depths of the ocean could not be recaptured. The Americans, however, were not discouraged. Cyrus Field, the bold promoter of the enterprise, as he had sunk all his own fortune, set a new subscription on foot, which was at once answered, and another cable was constructed on better principles. The bundles of conducting wires were each enveloped in gutta percha, and protected by a wadding of hemp, contained in a metallic covering. The Great Eastern sailed on the 13th of July, 1866. The operation worked well. But one incident occurred. Several times in unrolling the cable, they observed that nails had recently been forced into it, evidently with the motive of destroying it. Captain Anderson, the officers and engineers, consulted together, and had it posted up that, if the offender was surprised on board, he would be thrown without further trial into the sea. From that time, the criminal attempt was never repeated. On the 23rd of July the Great Eastern was not more than 500 miles from Newfoundland, when they telegraphed from Ireland the news of the armistice, concluded between Prussia and Austria after Sadawa. On the 27th, in the midst of heavy fogs, they reached the port of Hart's content. The enterprise was successfully terminated, and for its first dispatch, Young America addressed Old Europe in these words of wisdom, so rarely understood, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill towards men. I did not expect to find the electric cable in its primitive state, such as it was on leaving the manufactory. The long serpent, covered with the remains of shells, bristling with foraminifery, was encrusted with a strong coating which served as a protection against all boring mollusks. It lay quietly sheltered from the motions of the sea, and under a favorable pressure for the transmission of the electric spark which passes from Europe to America in 0 0.32 of a second. Doubtless this cable will last for a great length of time, for they find that the gutta percha covering is improved by the sea water. Besides, on this level, so well chosen, the cable is never so deeply submerged as to cause it to break. The Nautilus followed it to the lowest depth, which 
was more than 2,212 fathoms, and there it lay without any anchorage, and then. We reached the spot where the accident had taken place in 1863. The bottom of. The ocean then formed a valley about 100 miles broad, in which Mont Blanc might. Have been placed without its summit appearing above the waves. This valley is. Closed at the east by a perpendicular wall more than 2,000 yards high. We arrived there on the 28th of May, and the Nautilus was then not more than 120 miles from Ireland. Was Captain Nemo going to land on the British Isles? No. To my great surprise, he made for the south, once more coming back towards European seas. In rounding the Emerald Isle, for one instant I caught sight of Cape Clear, and the light which guides the thousands of vessels leaving Glasgow or Liverpool. An important question then arose in my mind. Did the Nautilus dare entangle itself in the Manch? Ned Land, who had reappeared since we had been nearing land, did not cease to question me. How could I answer? Captain Nemo remained invisible. After having shown the Canadian a glimpse of American shores, was he going to show me the coast of France? But the Nautilus was still going southward. On the 30th of May, it passed in sight of Land's End, between the extreme point of England and the Scilly Isles, which were left to starboard. If we wished to enter the Manche, he must go straight to the east. He did not do so. During the whole of the 31st of May, the Nautilus described a series of circles on the water, which greatly interested me. It seemed to be seeking a spot it had some trouble in finding. At noon, Captain Nemo himself came to work. The ship's log. He spoke no word to me, but seemed gloomier than ever. What could sadden him thus? Was it his proximity to European shores? Had he some recollections of his abandoned country? If not, what did he feel? Remorse or regret? For a long while this thought haunted my mind, and I had a kind of presentiment that before long chance would betray the captain's secrets. The next day, the 1st of June, the Nautilus continued the same process. It was evidently seeking some particular spot in the ocean. Captain Nemo took the sun's altitude as he had done the day before. The sea was beautiful, the sky clear. About eight miles to the east, a large steam vessel could be discerned on the horizon. No flag fluttered from its mast, and I could not discover its nationality. Some minutes before the sun passed the meridian, Captain Nemo took his sextant, and watched with great attention. The perfect rest of the water greatly helped the operation. The Nautilus was motionless, it neither rolled nor pitched. I was on the platform when the altitude was taken, and the captain pronounced these words, it is here. He turned and went below. Had he seen the vessel which was changing its course, and seemed to be nearing us? I could not tell. I returned to the saloon. The panels closed. I heard the hissing of the water in the reservoirs. The Nautilus began to sink, following a vertical line, for its screw communicated no motion to it. Some minutes later it stopped at a depth of more than 420 fathoms, resting on the ground. The luminous ceiling was darkened. Then the panels were opened, and through the glass I saw the sea brilliantly illuminated by the rays of our lantern for at least half a mile round us. I looked to the port side, and saw nothing but an immensity of quiet waters. But to starboard, on the bottom appeared a large protuberance, which at once attracted my attention. One would have thought it a ruin buried under a coating of white shells, much resembling a covering of snow. Upon examining the mass, attentively, I could recognize the ever-thickening form of a vessel bare of its masts, which must have sunk 
it certainly belonged to past times. This wreck, to be thus encrusted with the lime of the water, must already be able to count. Many years passed at the bottom of the ocean. What was this vessel? Why did the Nautilus visit its tomb? Could it have been aught but a shipwreck which had drawn it under the water? I knew not what to think, when near me in a slow voice I heard Captain Nemo say. At one time this ship was called the Marseillaise. It carried 74 guns, and was launched in 1762. In 1778, the 13th of August, commanded by La Poit Vertrios, it fought boldly against the Preston. In 1779, on the 4th of July, it was at the taking of Granada, with the squadron of Admiral Esting. In 1781, on the 5th of September, it took part in the Battle of Conte de Grasse in Chesapeake Bay. In 1794, the French Republic changed its name. On the 16th of April, in the same year, it joined the squadron of Villaret Joyeuse, at Brest, being entrusted with the escort of a cargo of corn coming from America. Under the command of Admiral Van Stebel. On the 11th and 12th prayeral of the second year, this squadron fell in with an English vessel. Sir, Today is the 13th prayeral, the 1st of June, 1868. It is now 74 years ago, day. For day on this very spot, in latitude 47 degrees 24 minutes, longitude 17 degrees 28, that this vessel, after fighting heroically, losing its three masts, with the water in its hold, and the third of its crew disabled preferred sinking with its 356 sailors to surrendering, and, nailing its colors to the poop, disappeared under the waves to the cry of long live the Republic. The Avenger. I exclaimed. Yes, sir, the Avenger. A good name, muttered Captain Nemo, crossing his arms. Chapter XXI. A Hecatome. The way of describing this unlooked for scene, the history of the Patriot ship. Told at first so coldly, and the emotion with which this strange man pronounced. The last words, the name of the Avenger, the significance of which could not escape me, all impressed itself deeply on my mind. My eyes did not leave the captain, who, with his hand stretched out to sea, was watching with a glowing eye the glorious wreck. Perhaps I was never to know who he was, from whence he came, or where he was going to, but I saw the man move, and apart from the savant. It was no common misanthropy which had shut Captain Nemo and his companions within the Nautilus, but a hatred, either monstrous or sublime, which time could never weaken. Did this hatred still seek for vengeance? The future would soon teach me that. But the Nautilus was rising slowly to the surface of the sea, and the form of the Avenger disappeared by degrees from my sight. Soon a slight rolling told me that we were in the open air. At that moment a dull boom was heard. I looked at the captain. He did not move. Captain, said I. He did not answer. I left him and mounted the platform. Consile and the Canadian were already there. Where did that sound come from? I asked. It was a gunshot, replied Ned Land. I looked in the direction of the vessel I had already seen. It was nearing the Nautilus, and we could see that it was putting on steam. It was within six miles of us. What is that ship, Ned? By its rigging, and the height of its lower masts, said the Canadian, I bet. She is a ship of war. May it reach us, and, if necessary, sink this cursed. Nautilus. Friend Ned, replied Consile, what harm can it do to the Nautilus? Can. It attack it beneath the waves? 
can its cannonade us at the bottom of the sea? Tell me, Ned, said I, can you recognize what country she belongs to? The Canadian knitted his eyebrows, dropped his eyelids, and screwed up the corners of his eyes, and for a few moments fixed a piercing look upon the vessel. No, sir, he replied, I cannot tell what nation she belongs to, for she shows no colors. But I can declare she is a man of war, for a long pennant flutters from her main mast. For a quarter of an hour we watched the ship which was steaming towards us. I could not, however, believe that she could see the Nautilus from that distance, and still less that she could know what the submarine engine was. Soon the Canadian informed me that she was a large, armored, two-decker ram. A thick black smoke was pouring from her two funnels. Her closely furled sails were stopped to her yards. She hoisted no flag at her mizzen peak. The distance prevented us from distinguishing the colors of her pennant, which floated like a thin ribbon. She advanced rapidly. If Captain Nemo allowed her to approach, there was a chance of salvation for us. Sir, said Ned Land, if that vessel passes within a mile of us I shall throw myself into the sea, and I should advise you to do the same. I did not reply to the Canadian suggestion, but continued watching the ship. Whether English, French, American, or Russian, she would be sure to take us in. If we could only reach her. Presently a white smoke burst from the forepart of the vessel, some seconds after, the water, agitated by the fall of a heavy body, splashed the stern of the Nautilus, and shortly afterwards a loud explosion struck my ear. What, they are firing at us? I exclaimed. So please you, sir, said Ned, they have recognized the unicorn, and they are firing at us. But, I exclaimed, surely they can see that there are men in the case. It is, perhaps, because of that, replied Ned Land, looking at me. A whole flood of light burst upon my mind. Doubtless they knew now how to believe the stories of the pretended monster. No doubt, on board the Abraham Lincoln, when the Canadian struck it with the harpoon, Commander Farragut had recognized in the supposed narwhal a submarine vessel, more dangerous than a supernatural cetacean. Yes, it must have been so, and on every sea they were now seeking this engine of destruction. Terrible indeed. If, as we supposed, Captain Nemo employed the Nautilus in works of vengeance. On the night, when we were imprisoned in that cell, in the midst of the Indian Ocean, had he not attacked some vessel? The man buried in the Coral Cemetery, had he not been a victim to the shock caused by the Nautilus? Yes, I repeated, it must be so. One part of the mysterious existence of Captain Nemo had been unveiled. And, if his identity had not been recognized, at least, the nations united against him were no longer hunting a chimerical creature, but a man who had vowed a deadly hatred against them. All the formidable past rose before me. Instead of meeting friends on board the approaching ship, we could only expect pitiless enemies. But the shot rattled about us. Some of them struck the sea and ricocheted, losing themselves in the distance. But none touched the Nautilus. The vessel was not more than three miles from us. In spite of the serious cannonade, Captain Nemo did not appear on the platform, but, if one of the conical projectiles had struck the shell of the Nautilus, it would have been fatal. The Canadian then said, Sir, we must do all we can to get out of this dilemma. Let us signal them. They will then, perhaps, understand that we are honest folks. Ned Land took his handkerchief to wave in the air, but he had scarcely displayed it, when he was struck down by an iron hand, and fell, in spite of his great strength, 
upon the deck. Fool, exclaimed the captain, do you wish to be pierced by the spur of the Nautilus before it is hurled at this vessel? Captain Nemo was terrible to hear, he was still more terrible to see. His face was deadly pale, with a spasm at his heart. For an instant it must have ceased to beat. His pupils were fearfully contracted. He did not speak, he roared, as with his body thrown forward, he wrung the Canadian's shoulders. Then, leaving him, and turning to the ship of war, whose shot was still raining around him. He exclaimed, with a powerful voice, Ah, ship of an accursed nation, you know who I am. I do not want your colors to know you by. Look. And I will show you. Mine. And on the forepart of the platform Captain Nemo unfurled a black flag. Similar to the one he had placed at the South Pole. At that moment a shot struck the shell of the Nautilus obliquely, without piercing it, and, rebounding near the captain, was lost in the sea. He shrugged his shoulders, and, addressing me, said shortly, Go down, you and your companions, go down. Sir, I cried, are you going to attack this vessel? Sir, I am going to sink it. You will not do that. I shall do it he replied coldly. And I advise you not to judge me, sir. Fate has shown you what you ought not to have seen. The attack has begun, go. Down. What is this vessel? You do not know? Very well. So much the better. Its nationality to you, at least, will be a secret. Go down. We could but obey. About fifteen of the sailors surrounded the captain, looking with implacable hatred at the vessel nearing them. One could feel that the same desire of vengeance animated every soul. I went down at the moment another projectile struck the Nautilus, and I heard the captain exclaim. Strike, mad vessel. Shower your useless shot. And then, you will not escape. The spur of the Nautilus but it is not here that you shall perish. I would not have your ruins mingle with those of the Avenger. I reached my room. The captain and his second had remained on the platform. The screw was set in motion, and the Nautilus, moving with speed, was soon beyond the reach of the ship's guns. But the pursuit continued, and Captain Nemo contented himself with keeping his distance. About four in the afternoon, being no longer able to contain my impatience, I went to the central staircase. The panel was open, and I ventured onto the platform. The captain was still walking up and down with an agitated step. He was looking at the ship, which was five or six miles to leeward. He was going round it like a wild beast, and, drawing it eastward, he allowed them to pursue. But he did not attack. Perhaps he still hesitated. I wished to mediate once more. But I had scarcely spoken, when Captain Nemo imposed silence, saying, I am the law, and I am the judge. I am the oppressed, and there is the oppressor. Through him I have lost all that I loved, cherished, and venerated country, wife, children, father, and mother. I saw all perish. All that I hate is there. Say no more. I cast a last look at the man of war, which was putting on steam, and rejoined. Ned and Consile. We will fly. I exclaimed. Good, said Ned. What is this vessel? I do not know, but, whatever it is, it will be sunk before night. In any case, it is better to perish with it, than be made accomplices in a retaliation the justice of which we cannot judge. That is my opinion too, said Ned Land, coolly. Let us wait for night. Night arrived. Deep silence reigned on board. The compass showed that the 
Nautilus had not altered its course. It was on the surface, rolling. Slightly. My companions and I resolved to fly when the vessel should be near. Enough either to hear us or to see us, for the moon, which would be full in two. Or three days, shone brightly. Once on board the ship, if we could not prevent. The blow which threatened it, we could, at least we would, do all that. Circumstances would allow. Several times I thought the Nautilus was. Preparing for attack, but Captain Nemo contented himself with allowing his. Adversary to approach, and then fled once more before it. Part of the night passed without any incident. We watched the opportunity for. Action. We spoke little, for we were too much moved. Ned Land would have thrown. Himself into the sea, but I forced him to wait. According to my idea, the. Nautilus would attack the ship at her water line, and then it would not. Only be possible, but easy to fly. At three in the morning, full of uneasiness, I mounted the platform. Captain. Nemo had not left it. He was standing at the forepart near his flag, which a slight breeze displayed above his head. He did not take his eyes from the vessel. The intensity of his look seemed to attract and fascinate and draw it onward more surely than if he had been towing it. The moon was then passing the meridian. Jupiter was rising in the east. Amid this peaceful scene of nature, sky and ocean rivaled each other in tranquility, the sea offering to the orbs of night the finest mirror they could ever have in which to reflect their image. As I thought of the deep calm of these elements, compared with all those passions brooding imperceptibly within the Nautilus, I shuddered. The vessel was within two miles of us. It was ever nearing that phosphorescent light which showed the presence of the Nautilus. I could see its green and red lights, and its white lantern hanging from the large foremast. An indistinct vibration quivered through its rigging, showing that the furnaces were heated to the uttermost. Sheaves of sparks and red ashes flew from the funnels, shining in the atmosphere like stars. I remained thus until six in the morning, without Captain Nemo noticing me. The ship stood about a mile and a half from us, and with the first dawn of day the firing began afresh. The moment could not be far off when, the Nautilus Attacking its adversary, my companions, and myself should forever leave this. Man. I was preparing to go down to remind them, when the second mounted the. Platform, accompanied by several sailors. Captain Nemo either did not or would. Not see them. Some steps were taken which might be called the signal for. Action. They were very simple. The iron balustrade around the platform was lowered, and the lantern and pilot cages were pushed within the shell until they were flush with the deck. The long surface of the steel cigar no longer offered a single point to check its maneuvers. I returned to the saloon. The Nautilus still floated, some streaks of light were filtering through the liquid beds. With the undulations of the waves the windows were brightened by the red streaks of the rising sun, and this dreadful day of the 2nd of June had dawned. At 5 o'clock, the log showed that the speed of the Nautilus was slackening, and I knew that it was allowing them to draw nearer. Besides, the reports were heard more distinctly, and the projectiles, laboring through the ambient water, were extinguished with a strange hissing noise. My friends, said I, the moment is come. One grasp of the hand, and may God protect us. Ned Land was resolute, concile calm, myself so nervous that I knew not how to contain myself. We all passed into the library, but the moment I pushed the door opening onto the central staircase, I heard the upper panel close. Sharply. The Canadian rushed onto the stairs, but I stopped him. A well-known 
hissing noise told me that the water was running into the reservoirs, and in a few minutes the Nautilus was some yards beneath the surface of the waves. I understood the maneuver. It was too late to act. The Nautilus did not wish to strike at the impenetrable cuirass, but below the water line, where the metallic covering no longer protected it. We were again imprisoned, unwilling witnesses of the dreadful drama that was preparing. We had scarcely time to reflect, taking refuge in my room, we looked at each other without speaking. A deep stupor had taken hold of my mind. Thought seemed to stand still. I was in that painful state of expectation. Preceding a dreadful report. I waited, I listened, every sense was merged in. That of hearing. The speed of the Nautilus was accelerated. It was. Preparing to rush. The whole ship trembled. Suddenly I screamed. I felt the. Shock, but comparatively light. I felt the penetrating power of the steel spur. I heard rattlings and scrapings. But the Nautilus, carried along by its propelling power, passed through the mass of the vessel like a needle through sailcloth. I could stand it no longer. Mad, out of my mind, I rushed from my room into the saloon. Captain Nemo was there, mute, gloomy, implacable, he was looking through the port panel. A large mass cast a shadow on the water, and, that it might lose nothing of her agony, the Nautilus was going down into the abyss with her. Ten yards from me I saw the open shell, through which the water was rushing with the noise of thunder, then the double line of guns and the netting. The bridge was covered with black, agitated shadows. The water was rising. The poor creatures were crowding the ratlins, clinging to the masts, struggling under the water. It was a human ant heap overtaken by the sea. Paralyzed, stiffened with anguish, my hair standing on end, with eyes wide open, panting, without breath, and without voice, I too was watching. An irresistible attraction glued me to the glass. Suddenly an explosion took place. The compressed air blew up her decks, as if the magazines had caught fire. Then the unfortunate vessel sank more rapidly. Her topmast, laden with victims, now appeared, then her spars, bending under the weight of men, and last of all, the top of her main mast. Then the dark mass disappeared, and with it the dead crew, drawn down by the strong eddy. The unfortunate vessel sank more rapidly. I turned to Captain Nemo. That terrible Avenger, a perfect archangel of hatred, was still looking. When all was over, he turned to his room, opened the door, and entered. I followed him with my eyes. On the end wall beneath his heroes, I saw the portrait of a woman, still young, and two little children. Captain Nemo looked at them for some moments, stretched his arms towards them, and, kneeling down, burst into deep sobs. Chapter XXII The Last Words of Captain Nemo The panels had closed on this dreadful vision, but light had not returned to the saloon, all was silence and darkness within the Nautilus. At wonderful speed, a hundred feet beneath the water, it was leaving this desolate spot. Whither was it going? To the north or south? Where was the man flying to? After such dreadful retaliation? I had returned to my room, where Ned and Consile had remained silent enough. I felt an insurmountable horror for Captain Nemo. Whatever he had suffered at the hands of these men, he had no right to punish thus. He had made me, if not an accomplice, at least a witness of his vengeance. At eleven the electric light reappeared. I passed into the saloon. It was deserted. I consulted the different instruments. 
the Nautilus was flying northward at the rate of 25 miles an hour, now on the surface, and now 30 feet below it. On taking the bearings by the chart, I saw that we were passing the mouth of the Manche, and that our course was hurrying us towards the northern seas at a frightful speed. That night we had crossed two hundred leagues of the Atlantic. The shadows fell, and the sea was covered with darkness until the rising of the moon. I went to my room, but could not sleep. I was troubled with dreadful nightmare. The horrible scene of destruction was continually before my eyes. From that day, who could tell into what part of the North Atlantic Basin the Nautilus would take us? Still with unaccountable speed. Still in the midst of these northern fogs. Would it touch at Spitsbergen, or on the shores of Nova Zembla? Should we explore those unknown seas, the White Sea, the Sea of Kara, the Gulf of Obi, the Archipelago of Lyre Rove, and the unknown coast of Asia? I could not say. I could no longer judge of the time that was passing. The clocks had been stopped on board. It seemed, as in polar countries, that night and day no longer followed their regular course. I felt myself being drawn into that strange region where the foundered imagination of Edgar Poe roamed at will. Like the fabulous Gordon Pym, at every moment I expected to see that veiled human figure, of larger proportions than those of any inhabitant of the earth, thrown across the cataract which defends the approach to the pole. I estimated, though, perhaps, I may be mistaken, I estimated this adventurous course of the Nautilus to have lasted fifteen or twenty days. And I know not how much longer it might have lasted, had it not been for the catastrophe which ended this voyage. Of Captain Nemo I saw nothing whatever now, nor of his second. Not a man of the crew was visible for an instant. The Nautilus was almost incessantly underwater. When we came to the surface to renew the air, the panels opened and shut mechanically. There were no more marks on the planisphere. I knew not where we were. And the Canadian, too, his strength and patience at an end, appeared no more. Consile could not draw a word from him, and, fearing that, in a dreadful fit of madness, he might kill himself, watched him with constant devotion. One morning, what date it was I could not say, I had fallen into a heavy sleep towards the early hours, a sleep both painful and unhealthy, when I suddenly awoke. Ned Land was leaning over me, saying, in a low voice, we are going to fly. I sat up. When shall we go? I asked. Tonight. All inspection on board the Nautilus seems to have ceased. All appear to be stupefied. You will be ready, sir. Yes, where are we? In sight of land. I took the reckoning this morning in the fog twenty miles to the east. What country is it? I do not know, but, whatever it is, we will take refuge there. Yes, Ned, yes. We will fly tonight, even if the sea should swallow us up. The sea is bad, the wind violent, but twenty miles in that light boat of the Nautilus does not frighten me. Unknown to the crew, I have been able to procure food and some bottles of water. I will follow you. But, continued the Canadian, if I am surprised, I will defend myself, I will force them to kill me. We will die together, friend Ned. I had made up my mind to all. The Canadian left me. I reached the platform, on which I could with difficulty support myself against the shock of the waves. The sky was threatening, but, as land was in those thick brown shadows, we must fly. I returned to the saloon, fearing and yet hoping to see Captain Nemo. Wishing and yet not wishing to see him. What could I have said to him? 
Could I hide the involuntary horror with which he inspired me? No. It was better that I should not meet him face to face, better to forget him. And yet how long seemed that day, the last that I should pass in the Nautilus. I remained alone. Ned Land and Consil avoided speaking, for fear of betraying themselves. At six I dined, but I was not hungry, I forced myself to eat in spite of my disgust, that I might not weaken myself. At half past six Ned Land came to my room, saying, we shall not see each other again before our departure. At ten. The moon will not be risen. We will profit by the darkness. Come to the boat. Consile and I will wait for you. The Canadian went out without giving me time to answer. Wishing to verify the course of the Nautilus, I went to the saloon. We were running NNE at frightful speed, and more than fifty yards deep. I cast a last look on these wonders of nature, on the riches of art heaped up in this museum, upon the unrivaled collection destined to perish at the bottom of the sea, with him who had formed it. I wished to fix an indelible impression of it in my mind. I remained an hour thus, bathed in the light of that luminous ceiling, and passing in review those treasures shining under their glasses. Then I returned to my room. I dressed myself in strong sea clothing. I collected my notes, placing them carefully about me. My heart beat loudly. I could not check its pulsations. Certainly my trouble and agitation would have betrayed me to Captain Nemo's eyes. What was he doing at this moment? I listened at the door of his room. I heard steps. Captain Nemo was there. He had not gone to rest. At every moment I expected to see him appear, and ask me why I wished to fly. I was constantly on the alert. My imagination magnified everything. The impression became at last so poignant that I asked myself if it would not be better to go to the captain's room, see him face to face, and brave him with look and gesture. It was the inspiration of a madman, fortunately I resisted the desire, and stretched myself on my bed to quiet my bodily agitation. My nerves were somewhat calmer, but in my excited brain I saw over again all my existence on board the Nautilus, every incident, either happy or unfortunate, which had happened since my disappearance from the Abraham Lincoln the submarine hunt, the Torres Straits, the savages of Papua, the running ashore, the coral cemetery, the passage of Suez, the island of St. Oran, the Cretan diver, Vigo Bay, Atlantis, the iceberg, the South Pole, the imprisonment in the ice, the fight among the pulps, the storm in the Gulf Stream, the Avenger, and the horrible scene of the vessel sunk with all her crew. All these events passed before my eyes like scenes in a drama. Then Captain Nemo seemed to grow enormously, his features to assume superhuman proportions. He was no longer my equal, but a man of the waters, the genie of the sea. It was then half past nine. I held my head between my hands to keep it from bursting. I closed my eyes, I would not think any longer. There was another half hour to wait, another half hour of a nightmare, which might drive me mad. At that moment I heard the distant strains of the organ, a sad harmony to an undefinable chant, the wail of a soul longing to break these earthly bonds. I listened with every sense, scarcely breathing, plunged, like Captain Nemo, in that musical ecstasy, which was drawing him in spirit to the end of life. Then a sudden thought terrified me. Captain Nemo had left his room. He was in the saloon, which I must cross to fly. There I should meet him for the last time. He would see me, perhaps speak to me. A gesture of his might destroy me. A single word chain me on board. 
but Ten was about to strike. The moment had come for me to leave my room, and join my companions. I must not hesitate, even if Captain Nemo himself should rise before me. I opened my door carefully, and even then, as it turned on its hinges, it seemed to me to make a dreadful noise. Perhaps it only existed in my own imagination. I crept along the dark stairs of the Nautilus, stopping at each step to check the beating of my heart. I reached the door of the saloon, and opened it. Gently. It was plunged in profound darkness. The strains of the organ sounded. Faintly. Captain Nemo was there. He did not see me. In the full light I do not think he would have noticed me, so entirely was he absorbed in the ecstasy. I crept along the carpet, avoiding the slightest sound which might betray my presence. I was at least five minutes reaching the door, at the opposite side. Opening into the library. I was going to open it, when a sigh from Captain Nemo nailed me to the spot. I knew that he was rising. I could even see him, for the light from the library came through to the saloon. He came towards me silently, with his arms crossed, gliding like a specter rather than walking. His breast was swelling with sobs. And I heard him murmur these words, the last which ever struck my ear. Almighty God, enough, enough. Was it a confession of remorse which thus escaped from this man's conscience? In desperation, I rushed through the library, mounted the central staircase, and, following the upper flight, reached the boat. I crept through the opening, which had already admitted my two companions. Let us go, let us go. I exclaimed. Directly, replied the Canadian. The orifice in the plates of the Nautilus was first closed, and fastened. Down by means of a false key, with which Ned Land had provided himself, the opening in the boat was also closed. The Canadian began to loosen the bolts, which still held us to the submarine boat. Suddenly a noise was heard. Voices were answering each other loudly. What was the matter? Had they discovered our flight? I felt Ned Land slipping a dagger into my hand. Yes, I murmured we know how to die. The Canadian had stopped in his work. But one word many times repeated, a dreadful word, revealed the cause of the agitation spreading on board the Nautilus. It was not we the crew were looking after. The maelstrom, the maelstrom. Could a more dreadful word in a more dreadful situation have sounded in our ears? We were then upon the dangerous coast of Norway. Was the Nautilus being drawn into this gulf at the moment our boat was going to leave its sides? We knew that at the tide the pent-up waters between the islands of Faroe and Lofoten rush with irresistible violence, forming a whirlpool from which no vessel ever escapes. From every point of the horizon enormous waves were meeting, forming a gulf justly called the navel of the ocean, whose power of attraction extends to a distance of 12 miles. There, not only vessels, but whales are sacrificed, as well as white bears from the northern regions. It is thither that the Nautilus, voluntarily or involuntarily, had been run by the captain. It was describing a spiral, the circumference of which was lessening by degrees, and the boat, which was still fastened to its side, was carried along. With giddy speed. I felt that sickly giddiness which arises from long continued. Whirling round. We were in dread. Our horror was at its height, circulation had stopped, all. Nervous influence was annihilated, and we were covered with cold sweat, like a. Sweat of agony. And what noise around our frail bark. What roarings repeated by. The echo miles away. What an uproar was that of the waters broken on the sharp rocks at the bottom, where the hardest bodies are crushed, and trees worn away. With all the fur rubbed off, according to the Norwegian phrase. 
What a situation to be in. We rocked frightfully. The Nautilus defended. Itself like a human being. Its steel muscles cracked. Sometimes it seemed to. Stand upright, and we with it. We must hold on, said Ned, and look after the bolts. We may still be saved. If we stick to the Nautilus. He had not finished the words, when we heard a crashing noise, the bolts gave way, and the boat, torn from its groove, was hurled like a stone from a sling. Into the midst of the whirlpool. My head struck on a piece of iron, and with the violent shock I lost all. Consciousness. Chapter XXIII. Conclusion. Thus ends the voyage under the seas. What passed during that night how the boat escaped from the eddies of the maelstrom how Ned Land, Consile, and myself ever came out of the gulf, I cannot tell. But when I returned to consciousness, I was lying in a fisherman's hut, on the Lofoden Isles. My two companions, safe and sound, were near me holding my hands. We embraced each other heartily. At that moment we could not think of returning to France. The means of communication between the north of Norway and the south are rare. And I am therefore obliged to wait for the steamboat running monthly from Cape North. And, among the worthy people who have so kindly received us, I revise my record of these adventures once more. Not a fact has been omitted, not a detail. Exaggerated. It is a faithful narrative of this incredible expedition in an element inaccessible to man, but to which progress will one day open a road. Shall I be believed? I do not know. And it matters little, after all. What I now affirm is, that I have a right to speak of these seas, under which, in less than ten months, I have crossed twenty thousand leagues in that submarine tour of the world, which has revealed so many wonders. But what has become of the Nautilus? Did it resist the pressure of the maelstrom? Does Captain Nemo still live? And does he still follow under the ocean those frightful retaliations? Or, did he stop after the last hecatomb? Will the waves one day carry to him this manuscript containing the history of his life? Shall I ever know the name of this man? Will the missing vessel tell us by its nationality that of Captain Nemo? I hope so. And I also hope that his powerful vessel has conquered the sea at its most terrible gulf, and that the Nautilus has survived where so many other vessels have been lost. If it be so if Captain Nemo still inhabits the ocean, his adopted country, may hatred be appeased in that savage heart. May the contemplation of so many wonders extinguish forever the spirit of vengeance. May the judge disappear, and the philosopher continue the peaceful exploration of the sea. If his destiny be strange, it is also sublime. Have I not understood it myself? Have I not lived ten months of this unnatural life? And to the question asked by Ecclesiastes three thousand years ago, that which is far off and exceeding deep, who can find it out, two men alone of all now living have the right to give an answer. Captain Nemo and myself. End of the Project Gutenberg ebook 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. Updated editions will replace the previous one the old editions will be renamed. Creating the works from print editions not protected by U.S. copyright. Law means that no one owns a United States copyright in these works. So the Foundation, and you, can copy and distribute it in the United States without permission and without paying copyright. Royalties. Special rules, set forth in the general terms of use part of this license, apply to copying and distributing project. Gutenberg Trademark Electronic Works to protect the Project Gutenberg Trademark Concept and Trademark Project Gutenberg is a registered trademark and may not be used if you charge for an ebook, except by following the terms of the trademark license, 
including paying royalties for use of the Project Gutenberg trademark. If you do not charge anything for copies of this ebook, complying with the trademark license is very easy. You may use this ebook for nearly any purpose, such as creation of derivative works, reports, performances, and research. Project Gutenberg ebooks may be modified and printed and given away. You may do practically anything in the United States with ebooks not protected by U.S. copyright law. Redistribution is subject to the trademark license, especially commercial redistribution. Start full license. The full Project Gutenberg license. Please read this before you distribute or use this work. To protect the Project Gutenberg trademark mission of promoting the free distribution of electronic works, by using or distributing this work, or any other work associated in any way with the phrase Project Gutenberg, you agree to comply with all the terms of the full Project Gutenberg trademark license available with this file or online at www.gutenberg.org slash license. Section 1. General Terms of Use and Redistributing Project Gutenberg Trademark. Electronic Works. 1.a. By reading or using any part of this Project Gutenberg Trademark. Electronic Work, you indicate that you have read, understand, agree to, and accept all the terms of this license and intellectual property. Trademark slash copyright, agreement. If you do not agree to abide by all the terms of this agreement, you must cease using and return or destroy all copies of Project Gutenberg trademark electronic works in your possession. If you paid a fee for obtaining a copy of or access to a Project Gutenberg trademark electronic work and you do not agree to be bound by the terms of this agreement, you may obtain a refund from the person or entity to whom you paid the fee as set forth in paragraph 1.e.8. 1.b Project Gutenberg is a registered trademark. It may only be used on or associated in any way with an electronic work by people who agree to be bound by the terms of this agreement. There are a few things that you can do with most Project Gutenberg trademark electronic works even without complying with the full terms of this agreement. C. Paragraph 1.C below. There are a lot of things you can do with Project Gutenberg trademark electronic works if you follow the terms of this agreement and help preserve free future access to Project Gutenberg trademark electronic works. See Paragraph 1.E below. 1.C. The Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation, the Foundation or PGLOF, owns a compilation copyright in the collection of Project Gutenberg trademark electronic works. Nearly all the individual works in the collection are in the public domain in the United States. If an individual work is unprotected by copyright law in the United States and you are located in the United States, we do not. Claim a right to prevent you from copying, distributing, performing, displaying or creating derivative works based on the work as long as all references to Project Gutenberg are removed. Of course, we hope that you will support the Project Gutenberg trademark mission of promoting free access to electronic works by freely sharing Project Gutenberg trademark works in compliance with the terms of this agreement for keeping the Project Gutenberg trademark name associated with the work. You can easily comply with the terms of this agreement by keeping this work in the same format with its attached full Project Gutenberg trademark license when you share it without charge with others. 1.d. The copyright laws of the place where you are located also govern what you can do with this work. Copyright laws in most countries are in a constant state of change. If you are outside the United States, check the laws of your country in addition to the terms of this agreement before downloading, copying, displaying, performing, distributing or creating derivative works based on this work or any 
other project Gutenberg trademark work. The foundation makes no representations concerning the copyright status of any work in any country other than the United States. 1.e Unless you have removed all references to Project Gutenberg. 1.e.1 1. The following sentence, with active links to, or other immediate access to, the full Project Gutenberg trademark license must appear prominently whenever any copy of a Project Gutenberg trademark work, any work on which the phrase Project Gutenberg appears, or with which the phrase Project Gutenberg is associated, is accessed, displayed, performed, viewed, copied, or distributed. This ebook is for the use of anyone anywhere in the United States and most other parts of the world at no cost and with almost no restrictions whatsoever. You may copy it, give it away or reuse it under the terms of the Project Gutenberg license included with this ebook or online at www.gutenberg.org. If you are not located in the United States, you will have to check the laws of the country where you are located before using this ebook. 1.e.2. If an individual Project Gutenberg trademark electronic work is derived from texts not protected by U.S. copyright law, does not contain a notice indicating that it is posted with permission of the copyright holder, the work can be copied and distributed to anyone in the United States without paying any fees or charges. If you are redistributing or providing access to a work with the phrase project Gutenberg associated with or appearing on the work, you must comply either with the requirements of paragraphs 1.e.1 through 1.e.7 or obtain permission for the use of the work and the project Gutenberg trademark. Trademark as set forth in paragraphs 1.e.8 or 1.e.9. 1.e.3 if an individual Project Gutenberg trademark electronic work is posted with the permission of the copyright holder, your use and distribution must comply with both paragraphs 1.e.1 through 1.e.7 and any additional terms imposed by the copyright holder. Additional terms will be linked to the Project Gutenberg trademark license for all works posted with the permission of the copyright holder found at the beginning of this work. 1.e.4. Do not unlink or detach or remove the full Project Gutenberg trademark license terms from this work, or any files containing a part of this work or any other work associated with Project Gutenberg trademark. 1.e.5. Do not copy, display, perform, distribute or redistribute this electronic work or any part of this electronic work, without prominently displaying the sentence set forth in paragraph 1.e.1 with active links or immediate access to the full terms of the project. Gutenberg trademark license. 1.e.6. You may convert to and distribute this work in any binary. Compressed, marked up, non-proprietary or proprietary form, including any word processing or hypertext form. However, if you provide access to or distribute copies of a Project Gutenberg trademark work in a format other than plain vanilla ASCII or other format used in the official version posted on the official Project Gutenberg trademark website www.gutenberg.org, you must, at no additional cost, fee, or expense to the user, provide a copy, a means of exporting a copy, or a means of obtaining a copy upon request, of the work in its original plane. Vanilla ASCII or other form. Any alternate format must include the full Project Gutenberg trademark license as specified in paragraph 1.e.1. 1.e.7. Do not charge a fee for access to, viewing, displaying performing, copying, or distributing any Project Gutenberg trademark works. Unless you comply with paragraph 1.e.8 or 1.e.9. 1.e.8. 
you may charge a reasonable fee for copies of or providing access to or distributing Project Gutenberg trademark electronic works. Provided that you pay a royalty fee of 20% of the gross profits you derive from the use of Project Gutenberg trademark works calculated using the method you already use to calculate your applicable taxes. The fee is owed to the owner of the Project Gutenberg trademark trademark, but he has agreed to donate royalties under this paragraph to the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation. Royalty payments must be paid within 60 days following each date on which you prepare, or are legally required to prepare, your periodic tax returns. Royalty payments should be clearly marked as such and sent to the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation at the address specified in Section 4, Information about Donations to the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation You provide a full refund of any money paid by a user who notifies you in writing, or by email, within 30 days of receipt that s slash he does not agree to the terms of the full Project Gutenberg trademark license. You must require such a user to return or destroy all copies of the works possessed in a physical medium and discontinue all use of and all access to other copies of Project Gutenberg trademark works. You provide, in accordance with paragraph 1.f.3, a full refund of any money paid for a work or a replacement copy, if a defect in the electronic work is discovered and reported to you within 90 days of receipt of the work. You comply with all other terms of this agreement for free distribution of Project Gutenberg trademark works. 1.e.9 If you wish to charge a fee or distribute a project Gutenberg trademark electronic work or group of works on different terms then are set forth in this agreement, you must obtain permission in writing. From the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation, the manager of the Project Gutenberg Trademark Trademark. Contact the Foundation as set. Fourth in Section 3 below. 1.f. 1.f.1. Project Gutenberg volunteers and employees expend considerable effort to identify, do copyright research on, transcribe and proofread. Works not protected by U.S. copyright law in creating the Project Gutenberg Trademark Collection. Despite these efforts, Project Gutenberg Trademark Electronic Works, and the medium on which they may be stored, may contain defects, such as, but not limited to, incomplete, inaccurate, or corrupt data, transcription errors, a copyright, or other intellectual property infringement, a defective or damaged disk or other medium, a computer virus, or computer codes that damage or cannot be read by your equipment. 1.f.2 Limited warranty, disclaimer of damages, except for the right of replacement or refund described in paragraph 1.f.3, the project. Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation, the owner of the project. Gutenberg Trademark Trademark, and any other party distributing a project. Gutenberg Trademark Electronic Work under this agreement, disclaim all liability to you for damages, costs, and expenses, including legal fees. You agree that you have no remedies for negligence, strict liability, breach of warranty or breach of contract except those provided in paragraph 1.f.3. You agree that the foundation, the trademark owner, and any distributor under this agreement will not be liable to you for actual, direct, indirect, consequential, punitive or incidental damages even if you give notice of the possibility of such damage. 1.f.3 Limited right of replacement or refund, if you discover a defect in this electronic work within 90 days of receiving it, you can receive a refund of the money, if any, you paid for it by sending a 
written explanation to the person you received the work from. If you received the work on a physical medium, you must return the medium with your written explanation. The person or entity that provided you with the defective work may elect to provide a replacement copy in lieu of a refund. If you received the work electronically, the person or entity providing it to you may choose to give you a second opportunity to receive the work electronically in lieu of a refund. If the second copy is also defective, you may demand a refund in writing without further opportunities to fix the problem. 1.F.4 Except for the limited right of replacement or refund set forth. In paragraph 1.F.3, this work is provided to you as is, with no other warranties of any kind, express or implied, including but not limited to warranties of merchantability or fitness for any purpose. 1.F.5 some states do not allow disclaimers of certain implied warranties or the exclusion or limitation of certain types of damages. If any disclaimer or limitation set forth in this agreement violates the law of the state applicable to this agreement, the agreement shall be interpreted to make the maximum disclaimer or limitation permitted by the applicable state law. The invalidity or Unenforceability of any provision of this agreement shall not void the remaining provisions. 1.F.6 Indemnity, you agree to indemnify and hold the foundation, the trademark owner, any agent, or employee of the foundation, anyone. Providing copies of Project Gutenberg trademark electronic works in accordance with this agreement, and any volunteers associated with the production, promotion, and distribution of Project Gutenberg trademark. Electronic works, harmless from all liability, costs, and expenses, including legal fees, that arise directly or indirectly from any of the following which you do or cause to occur, a. Distribution of this, or any Project Gutenberg trademark work, b. Alteration, modification, or additions or deletions to any Project Gutenberg trademark work, and, c, any defect you cause. Section 2. Information about the mission of Project Gutenberg trademark. Project Gutenberg trademark is synonymous with the free distribution of electronic works in formats readable by the widest variety of computers including obsolete, old, middle-aged, and new computers exists because of the efforts of hundreds of volunteers and donations from people in all walks of life. Volunteers and financial support to provide volunteers with the assistance they need are critical to reaching Project Gutenberg Trademark S. Goals and ensuring that the Project Gutenberg Trademark collection will remain freely available for generations to come. In 2001, the project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation was created to provide a secure and permanent future for Project Gutenberg trademark and future generations. To learn more about the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation and how your efforts and donations can help, see Sections 3 and 4 and the Foundation Information page at www.gutenberg.org. Section 3 Information about the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation The Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation is a non-profit 501, c. 3, educational corporation organized under the laws of the State of Mississippi and granted tax-exempt status by the Internal Revenue Service. The Foundation's INE or Federal Tax Identification Number is 64-6221541. Contributions to the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation are tax-deductible to the full extent permitted by U.S. federal laws and your state's laws. The Foundation's business office is located at 809 North 1500 West. Salt Lake City, Utah, 84116801-596-1887. Email contact links and up.
To date contact information can be found at the Foundation's website. An official page at www.gutenberg.org slash contact. Section 4. Information about donations to the Project Gutenberg. Literary Archive Foundation. Project Gutenberg trademark depends upon and cannot survive without widespread public support and donations to carry out its mission of increasing the number of public domain and licensed works that can be freely distributed in machine-readable form accessible by the widest array of equipment including outdated equipment. Many small donations, $1 to $5,000, are particularly important to maintaining tax-exempt status with the IRS. The Foundation is committed to complying with the laws regulating charities and charitable donations in all 50 states of the United States. Compliance requirements are not uniform and it takes a considerable effort, much paperwork, and many fees to meet and keep up with these requirements. We do not solicit donations in locations where we have not received written confirmation of compliance to send donations or determine the status of compliance for any particular state. Visit www.gutenberg.org slash donate. While we cannot and do not solicit contributions from states where we have not met the solicitation requirements, we know of no prohibition against accepting unsolicited donations from donors in such states who approach us with offers to donate. International donations are gratefully accepted, but we cannot make any statements concerning tax treatment of donations received from outside the United States. U.S. laws alone swamp our small staff. Please check the Project Gutenberg web pages for current donation methods and addresses. Donations are accepted in a number of other ways including checks, online payments, and credit card donations. To donate, please visit www.gutenberg.org slash donate. Section 5. General Information About Project Gutenberg Trademark Electronic Works Professor Michael S. Hart was the originator of the project. Gutenberg trademark concept of a library of electronic works that could be freely shared with anyone. For 40 years, he produced and distributed Project Gutenberg trademark ebooks with only a loose network of volunteer support. Project Gutenberg trademark ebooks are often created from several printed editions, all of which are confirmed as not protected by copyright in the U.S. unless a copyright notice is included. Thus, we do not necessarily keep ebooks in compliance with any particular paper edition. Most people start at our website which has the main PG search facility, www.gutenberg.org. This website includes information about Project Gutenberg trademark, including how to make donations to the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation, how to help produce our new ebooks, and how to Subscribe to our email newsletter to hear about new ebooks. 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. Contents. List of illustrations. Part 1. Chapter IA Shifting Reef. Chapter 2 Pro and Con. Chapter 3 I Form My Resolution. Chapter 4 Ned Land. Chapter V at Adventure. Chapter 6 at Full Steam. Chapter 7 An Unknown Species of Whale. Chapter 8 Mobilis in Mobili. Chapter 9 Ned Land's Tempers. Chapter X The Man of the Seas. Chapter 11 All by Electricity. Chapter 12 Some Figures. Chapter 13 The Black River. Chapter 14 A Note of Invitation. Chapter 15 A Walk on the Bottom of the Sea. Chapter 16 A Submarine Forest. Chapter 17 4000 Leagues Under the Pacific. Chapter 18 Vonicoro. Chapter 19 Torres Straits. Chapter XX A Few Days on Land. Chapter XXI Captain Nemo's Thunderbolt. Chapter XXII Igri Somnia. Chapter XXII The Coral Kingdom.
Part 2. Chapter I The Indian Ocean. Chapter 2 A Novel Proposal of Captain Nemo's. Chapter 3 A Pearl of Ten Millions. Chapter 4 The Red Sea. Chapter V The Arabian Tunnel. Chapter 6 The Grecian Archipelago. Chapter 7 The Mediterranean in 48 Hours. Chapter 8 Vigo Bay. Chapter 9 A Vanished Continent. Chapter X The Submarine Coal Mines. Chapter 11 The Sargasso Sea. Chapter 12 Cachalots and Whales. Chapter 13 The Iceberg. Chapter 14 The South Pole. Chapter 15 Accident or Incident. Chapter 16 Want of Air. Chapter 17 From Cape Horn to the Amazon. Chapter 18 The Pulps. Chapter 19 The Gulf Stream. Chapter XX From Latitude 47 degrees 24 minutes to Longitude 17 degrees 28 minutes. Chapter XXIA Hecatome. Chapter XXII The Last Words of Captain Nemo. Chapter XXIII Conclusion. The Full Project Gutenberg License.